driving, if you're watching this, give a thumbs up. Let me know you're on. something let us know you're watching all right well we are driving to Wooster Ohio we have finished our first day meeting at Cedar Falls now we were on to Wooster Ohio we'll be doing a meeting there I encourage you if you have not registered yet to get registered for one of our meetings we are doing some giveaways we are doing meeting specials offers giveaways that we are not offering any other time of the year just this one day at our meeting uh, you have to come and find out what that meeting is but uh, there are some free product giveaways buy product get product for free but again, this is only happening the day of the meeting, so you'll have to attend to be able to get those incentives and those offers. So I'll post a question about, anybody have a question we could answer? The question was about base saturation of potassium, and then how do you raise base saturation um, with or without the dry fertilizer or get that needle to move? The question for many is using potassium, knowing the effects of what KCL 0060 is going to do to the soil, being biologically minded, chlorine is obviously a byproduct or a product that comprises KCL chloride, split alternate to chlorine, which ends up going to the soil and is acting as another attachment to other nutrients it's been a necessary evil so to say of KCL being part of the history of farming now we see though in regards to biologicals the detriment effects that it has to soil biology in regards to microbial life some of you all watching this are going to think it's just a crock and it's not possible to raise K levels without dry fertilizer. My question I guess back to you is as long as you've been mapping your soils, you've been applying fertilizer, is there any tangible evidence showing that your yields have been influenced by the increase of potassium? On the back end of that, have you tested or proved that your biology is changing with that. I say that for this reason. So the history goes, we have a, a colleague of ours that has been, that we work with producing liquid fertilizer and it comes down to the battle of dry versus liquid. Can you efficiently and effectively supply enough potassium as well as phosphorus with liquid fertilizers. Now some of you all are going to quit watching this video because it goes against everything that you've ever believed when it comes to raising crops. And you say there's no way that can happen. Um, I've heard it all. I've seen it. I've been in conversations. However, I dare to differ that there are customers because we do have these customers that are actually using liquid fertilizer on their planter, foliar feeding it, throughout the year raising efficiently raising 250 280 300 plus bushel corn 80 bushel beans without the need of dry fertilizer I'll tell you an instance we had a meeting yesterday in Cedar Falls Iowa we had our good friend and customer Matt Brinks give a presentation data showed from 2003 whenever he had soil reports up to the time period of last year 2019 he had uh, presented three soil reports 2003 2014 and then 2019 
he showed the uh, base saturation levels, the uh, macronutrients, calcium, magnesium, and potassium, CECs, some of the micronutrients, uh, because back in 2003, they weren't testing, I don't think as much for him, they were testing all of, all of the micros. pH, obviously organic matter. So he starts out with a base saturation of three-ish, four-ish in 2003. He's using dry at that time, dry fertilizer, MAP, DAP, urea, KCL, using that as a source of fertility. He then switches in 2012. 2011 was the very last year of fall of 2011 that he stopped using any dry fertilizer. 2012 would have been his first year using liquid fertilizer. So he started using liquid fertilizer on the planter in 2012. I started working with him in 2014 and his conversations primarily dealt with increasing soil health and soil biology. So we started in 2014 using BioRed on the soil and the two by two broadcast in it on the soil. We did fall residue applications with the biology and the stark reality was that from 2003 where he was using dry three four percent base saturation on potassium up until 2019 his base saturation went up to as high as 5.9 percent on the field that he'd been pulling samples on at his home field so he had raised his potassium in essence almost nearly two points from 2003 to 2019 with stopping dry fertilizer in 2012. Um, I can't remember because I'm driving. I, I, th I think his K levels are in the 336 parts per million. They started out in the 100 or 200 range. I think it was 2003, it was two. 250 um, dropped down in 2014 to about 210 209 and then it was like I said up to 367 376 parts per million in 2019 when you look at the numbers on paper without knowing the history of stopping dry and going to liquid you would just assume that this grower had done a fine job about managing his potassium levels. However, the reality is that he hasn't used any dry on his farm since 2012. And again, I know a lot of people are probably gonna watch this video say that's not even possible. I don't know how you can argue with facts and results. This is black and white numbers. I'm not fabricating anything. If you come to our meetings, You'll get to see the chart, you'll get to see the numbers, you can see all this stuff. So the question goes back to how do I raise base saturation with potassium without the use of dry fertilizer? So we have the option of putting liquid on the planter, which for many, they don't think that it's going to supply enough. By putting liquid on the planter and supplying potassium and phosphorus around the seed, in the seed trench, next to the seed, foliar feeding it throughout the year, we're not pulling from reserves in the soil. We're not taxing the soil to the point that we have now removed, as the crop's removing nutrients, we're also removing it from our soil and our storage, our storehouse case in point would be Matt's story where he went from 250 parts per million in 2003 all the way up to 367 in 2019. How does that happen? Many people say that K is an immobile nutrient. However, over the years through um, weather, through tillage, through having the clay colloids, your soils collapse create compaction, hard pan layers, where does K go? Is it just locked up deep in the soil profile? Well, we would dare to say yes it is. How do we get that potassium that's deep in the soil profile? 
make it available. We, ate, we create capillaries in the soil profile, channels, that potassium now can move. How is this done? It's not done through tile, it's not done through ground equipment, ripping up the field, it's not done through tillage. It's done through the use of biologicals. Biologicals are the transfer means from which plants' roots are able to receive nutrients in the soil profile. So I would just propose to you, if you want to increase potassium levels in your soil profile, base saturations, yes, we have to look at other problematic nutrients, zinc, iron with phosphorus, the, the phosphorus to zinc ratio, phosphorus to iron ratio, aluminum, calcium, these other nutrients that are coming in through our fertilizers, dry fertilizers, lime, um, KCL, MAPDAP. We have to look at the quality of what we're putting out. But with technology that we have, this is why I'm sometimes wonder why growers go out and expend the, spend the expensive dollars on all this equipment to put liquid on their planter, but yet they're still using dry. The proximity of the seed to the actual nutrient supply is so close. You're subjecting yourself to so much loss in between that 30 inches of seed. There's so, so many things that could happen on that travel as that root here is growing to actually be able to penetrate and, and, and get into that uh, area where the nutrient's gonna be. There's three ways that nutrients are fed, excuse me, fed into the plant. It's through osmosis, movement of water gradients, um, it's mass flow of, uh, of movements, high grade to a low grade, and then actual root interception the root physically grows into the area where the nutrients are. Three ways. So mass flow is our greatest flow. Upwards of 78 to 82 percent of nutrients flow into that plant through mass flow movement. Inter, uh, interception of it actually growing into where that area is is less than one percent in the soil profile, square foot of the soil profile. And then we have Osmosis, I think it's less than 3%. It's, it's a very slow movement, and then the rest is just, you know, we're able, never able to tap into it. That sounds kind of um, simple, but yet the plant has to be breathing. We have to have movement in the xylem and the phloem. There has to be some new developing part of the plant growing. Roots need to be stimulated every 24 hours up until the point that we're able to hit reproductive stages and the plant starts to mature, the plant starts to slow down, we have to have activity. Well, this activity then garnishes and pushes us to have interaction with our soil. Plants are communicating with the soil, soils are releasing then the goods for the plant to grow. So, we raise our base saturations. For me, for us as a company, we promote liquid on the planter. I have no dealings, make no money off of precision planting. I'm not advocating that company is the only company, it's just the company that we've worked more with their products. The Furrow Jets, Yield360 has products out there. There's other companies that are bringing products to the market, already have products out there. The reason why Furrow Jets for us is beneficial is the fact that we can apply a liquid fertilizer, plant food, 31818, 924.3, 624.6. We can apply that off of the seed. There's no salts. There's no worry about any burn, issue of any burn. And then we can take water and biologicals and put that close to the seed, right on top of the seed. Yes, that requires two different pumps, different tanks, different hosing, but yet you're building soil health around the seed, reducing salt levels, and that's what we have to look at. How much salt is the KCL supplying? Potassium is a salt. Then you have chloride. Chloride splits off, ends up being chlorine. These are all detrimental to soil life. 
So I was talking about our colleague who um, tells the story. He has a customer. He's been in the industry for 38 years, produces the purest, best liquid fertilizer that you can find on the market. We promote and sell his product. That product for us is called Nutra HQ. A variety of products that we offer. That's what all of our customers use. He has a story where he has a, um, a student that was going for their PhD, was doing a thesis statement and was observing soil profiles that had used growers who had used dry fertilizer, growers that had used liquid, his liquid plant food for 35 years. So this student found a farm in Southern Illinois and then a farm outside of Hannibal, Missouri. Not real far in distance, but probably four hours apart. Similar soil textures, similar soil types. For 35 years, the one soil had dry fertilizer, KCL, um, MAP and DAP, whichever one, I'm not for sure, but supplying the phosphorus and potassium. For 35 years, another soil, a customer of his had been using this 31818 chemistry, low salt, 100% ortho food grade, the story goes that the student tested the bacteria per gram of soil. P bacteria per gram of soil. Not per pound, not per acre, per gram. You understand, per gram is a very, very minute amount of soil. Per gram. On average, a healthy soil is going to get 600 to 800 million bacteria per gram per soil. Okay? The 35 years of dry fertilizer, of which most farmers use, in this scenario, this grower had 400 million grams per soil. 400, 400 million per gram of soil, excuse me. So the grower that used dry, 400 million, the grower who used liquid was hitting over 3.7 billion with a B 3.7 billion uh, bacteria per gram of soil can you fathom that you're talking about it's and the grower that was using dry didn't even adequately hit the uh, the good level of bacteria per gram of soil at 400 million we're almost talking about a thousand percent increase just by using liquid you say, well, I want to see his yields. I want to see how well he's been doing. His yields have increased every year he's been using liquid on the planter. It's not just about how much is X's and O's. So many people get hung up on the X's and O's of how much it takes to raise a bushel of corn and a bushel of soybeans. I don't, I'm not arguing that. There's obviously a number that universities, growers are using but we're talking about data sets and data points that we are making on our farm. We're using these as resources. When this stuff was set back 20, 30, 40 years ago, I mean, we have new equipment on planters. We have new seed genetics. We have new formulations of liquid products, but yet we're still in the mindset and making decisions on our farm based upon old resources. I don't think that there's one customer watching this on your smartphone or on your tablet who has the old flip phone. You're not even able to watch this video if you have, uh, have a flip phone. So how come we can advance in some areas of our life with technology, but yet we refuse to advance in other areas? You guys are making millions of dollars of decisions, hundreds of thousand dollar decisions, and you're using old resource data points to determine whether you will or you whether you won't because generation has set in tradition has set in and you are determined that dry fertilizer is the only way to raise a raise a crop i posed the question yesterday in the meeting is tradition more important or is future more important so this is the defining line you're going to find yourself five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road. You might have farmed 20 crops, 
You might have farmed 30 seasons. Where are you going to be 5, 10 years down the road? Where's your soil? What type of condition is your soil going to be in 5, 10 years, 15 years down the road? If you want to become efficient, then yes, you need to get around people who are thinking outside the box, doing different things, and, and able to offer you quality products. This is where it comes down to. Quality, sound advice, and quality products. Fertilizer companies want to sell you fertilizer. No doubt about it. Universities want the farmer to, I'm going to probably get in trouble for this, and a lot of people are going to be turned off by this. Universities want you to use fertilizer. The universities are getting their pockets filled from the fertilizer companies because of the tonnage that's coming across the border or traded inside that state. They're making money. Anytime that I ship product from Missouri to Illinois or Missouri to Iowa, or Missouri to Nebraska, Missouri to Ohio, it's a tonnage report, okay? So we have to pay a fee, a percentage of what we ship into that state. While our numbers are very small, you can only imagine what a fertilizer company is using. Tons, hundreds, thousands of tons of fertilizer going to a state, going to a region. The universities are making money off of this. So yeah, they want you to use fertilizer. My question is to you, is tradition more important or is your future more important? If you truly are about soil health, then put action where your mouth is. Actually do the work. Test your soil. Understand where your soil biology is. And then for us, like we promote liquid fertilizer on the planter. If you're going to spend $30,000, $60,000, $100,000 plus dollars to upgrade your planter, put liquid on your planter, why not use quality products? Some of you all are using cheap products um, trying to save a buck two dollars a gallon and you don't understand that the quality of that product the reason why it's cheap is because there's other contaminants that are living and abiding in that product yeah it looks clear right it says yes it's an ortho product they're not telling you the whole story they're not telling you how much salts are in there uh, well they might may or may not they're not telling you how much aluminum is in there I mean, these companies run through and get waste to make the product that you're buying. You might be the second or third user of that acid, but you're buying it and you're using it because it's $1.50, $2 cheaper a gallon, and you refuse to buy our product that's $1.50 or $2 more a gallon because you want to save a buck. You want to save $2. But yet, the, if you were to take a magnifying glass and understand, you just destroyed millions, maybe billions over years of natural living bacteria and fungi. You killed it all. For what? $2 savings a gallon on a product? That's why I say, are you farming for the tradition or are you farming for the future? That's what you have to ask yourself. So the original question was, and if you got a question you can ask if you're watching this, farming question, ag question. The question was, how do I raise base saturations on potassium without the use of dry fertilizer? Simple question, simple answer is use BioRed. I can't speak for any other company. I can tell you that customers that are using our BioRed product they are efficiently raising their potassium levels. We see it in the soil. We see it in the tissue samples. And you say, how's that even possible? I have to tell you, the reason why it's possible is you're creating capillaries that go deep into the soil profile that you're not able to see. It wasn't put there by manual labor. It wasn't put there by a piece of equipment. It was done through channels and pathways that breed and grow deep into the soil profile. They're going out, they are finding the nutrients that are needed, then they're percolating it, sequestering it, bringing it up to the roots, up to the roots of that developing plant, and we're starting to find it in our soil reports, our analysis of the soil. This is how you raise base saturation. Can you do it with potassium? Just dry? Yeah. I'm sure people watching this video, you have your own reports. You 
can show me five years, eight years, nine years that you've been able to adjust potassium in your soil. Maybe you've raised your bushels, maybe you've raised your HPH averages, APH averages. Maybe you effectively have done that. On the back side of that though, I think the most important thing is what have you done to your microbial life in the process? We are all about biologicals. The safety, the health, and the longevity of your soil life has to be more important than a tradition. It has to be more important than where you're setting right now. So you wanna raise a percent, 2%, 3% on your potassium? Where do you start? You start with us using a, bio pro a product called BioRed. You apply BioRed in the row with your planter in furrow. You apply it pre-emerge uh, broadcast with your burn down herbicide. You're putting it on the soil. You're starting an application supplying microbes, biologicals to the soil that are going to have the function and the ability to get into your soil profile, go find potassium, end up making that available to the plant as that plant is growing. Can you do this in one year? Potentially. But it took you 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years to get to this level to where you, now you become frustrated. You become frustrated with your production. You're not happy with your numbers. You're not happy with the bushels. And you're wondering, how do I get into this next level? How do I break this yield barrier? You're going to have to go back and you'll start readjusting and looking at the basics of growing. And that's soil health. The seed genetics are obviously there. We know that we have the great seed genetics. It's 2020. We live in the 21st century. There's enough scientists, geneticists, DNA that have been put into seed to know that we have potential to raise high bushels. Guys are doing it, right? So what's your limiting factor? It's understanding your soil. It's understanding ratios between nutrients. It's not simply just focusing just on K or just on boron or just on nitrogen. Understanding the ratios between two nutrients and then what products or what practices is your farm implementing that is either causing degradation and loss or it's causing an increase of your soil and of your crops. This has to be written down on paper. You have to analyze, be critical of yourself, and self-evaluation. You have to look at your farming operation. Am I tilling way too much? Am I rotating my crops? Am I implementing biological products? Am I trying to feed the herds of microbes in my soil profile? I can't answer that. I don't know what that is. You know what those answers are. But I'm telling you, if you want to raise fertility in your soil without taxing the soil, you have to get biologicals involved. The answer for us that I would tell you would be a product like BioRed. We have multiple customers that are using these, this product and this chemistry and seeing nutrients become more available, crop response is higher, earlier emergence, better color throughout the year, better ability to decompose at the end of the year because of the nutritional value, the starch value of that crop is, is much higher. It lends itself to be a food source at the end of the year for microbes to feed on. So it's a domino effect, right? You're either going to stop the dominoes from falling with your practices or you're going to try to build that domino chain. You want those dominoes to continue to fall in your direction. So you're either gonna put in practices, you're gonna implement practices and approaches that are gonna keep putting the dominoes that are going in your favor. Or you're gonna have years upon years not knowing what you're doing, which again, it's not that you're ignorant, it's just maybe you didn't know, right? Not trying to say that you're in the fault here, but I'm giving you answers. It's up to you whether you decide to do something with that. BioRed, repetitious, continuous use of beneficial microorganisms implemented into your soil pro profile, there's, there's potassium there. The other answer is don't tax the soil Put a product like Nutra HQ 31818, 100% ortho, food grade product. If you have the equipment, if you have a planter that's ready, 
and can use liquid on the planter, use 318.18. Use it on the planter. I dare say your cost per acre, you'll be lower in cost per acre, your efficiency will go up. You start this trend after year one, two, three, four, and five, you'll look back and say, wow, I, I wish I would have done it before now. I wish I would have started this before now. And that process of doing that is going to help your soil biology. Does anybody ever, or anybody else have any questions? If you're on here, if you're a farmer, have questions, feel free to ask. Has anybody said anything? I got Chrissy in the back, but she doesn't want to be on the camera. Yeah. Go to the page and see. Is, is, is anybody here, if you have a question, go ahead and ask it. Go to the actual post if you can. Just take a few minutes here. All right, well, I think that's it for now. If you guys have any questions, feel free to message us. Let us know. We'll try to get them ready for the, uh, the next live. We'll be back on the road tomorrow. If you're watching this and you're in Ohio, please join us at Wooster. If you're in other states and you haven't signed up, I would encourage you to go ahead and sign up. Again, we have a one-day giveaway. One day, we are going to do something that we've never done with giving away product. You want to be there. You want to get information that we're going to share with you. Uh, Jimmy Frederick's going to be speaking uh, at the meetings. Will Cox will be speaking tomorrow in the Ohio meeting. Chad Hammer will also be in the Nebraska meetings. So we encourage you to come to the meeting attend the meeting and take advantage of this one day special i hope this uh, video has helped paul if you're watching give a thumbs up i hope the the question it was a long answer but i think it's important to look at the whole scope of things i tried to to do the best i could to answer your question and i think if you're able to attend to one of the meetings paul you'll see the numbers for themselves on the screen and, and see the hardcore numbers so I encourage you guys to come to the meetings. Appreciate you all watching, and we hope to work with you in this year in 2020. Thank you again.